Nightwatch 2, Nedvakn 2. Demons are forever, or in Danish, demoner go i au. Review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that overall I would say, yes, overall I, I did love. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And, you know, yeah, I I prefer this one to the, the first Night Watch movie. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie, you know, is too different from the original, so it sucks, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will be talking about some of the similarities. Now, I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. The the first chunk of the video is a spoiler-free review. I'm I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. And if I do decide at some point over the course of the review that I want to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger while I'm spoiling, so you so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Once, uh, yeah, you know, I will be spoiling the first movie. It's pretty much impossible to talk about this movie without talking about the end of the first movie, which drives a lot of this movie. And as soon as I'm the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie, including discussing the ending. So, yeah, according to IMDb, this is not rated. This would almost definitely be an R rating. And, yeah, so... There is not a lot of actual sex and nudity, though there are several. There's some times where they, they talk about it, but it's, yeah, it's not very much. There is a bit of violence, and some of it is on the, on the harsher side. There is some profanity. Ah, let's... Yeah, that one's probably about moderate. Uh, alcohol, drugs, and smoking is probably mild. Frightening and intense scenes, I would rate severe. Now, the... Let's see. Right. Um, given that this is a soft reboot, you know, I try to grade these on a curve, and the reason why is I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that, you know, there there are there are some things about this that are definitely I will criticize it, but I'm not gonna just this is one of the better of the soft reboots. It maybe helps that, you know, the original like we Danes like to you know praise it, it's not the best movie ever made. There's definitely some things about it that could have been better. I will definitely say this is yet another one of those cases where I don't really think it was made for any reason other than the success of the original. Like, I don't know if it's financial or like, you know, critical. I, I don't know 100% exactly what they are hoping to gain by making this, I can imagine they might. It's it's quite they they do quite a good job on it, but I don't think it would have been made if the original had not been, you know, in back in 1998 there was a stand-up comedian saying, "Finally, we Danes made a horror movie that actually works," you know, and yeah, I, you know, today we're seeing a lot of movies. Not not all movies today are soft reboots. But a lot of movies, a lot of the most expensive movies, a lot of the movies that do really well, at least financially, not always critically, are ones based on previous IP. And yeah, this is yet another case of that. You know, so, so yeah, uh, soft reboot similar to the Star Wars sequel trilogy or... You know, Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and somehow Palpatine Rejo The Rise of Skywalker. I don't know why. It's just, yeah. 
and the the new yeah and Halloween 2018. Let's see and yeah in general the the new Halloween. I guess primarily Halloween 2018. I suppose the others are more legacy sequels than Saw reboots. Now, I have only watched this once. I just got back from the movie theater bef right before I hit record on this. So, the plot. Almost 30 years after the events of the first one, 29 to be exact, Emma, daughter of Martin and Kalinka, who we learn committed suicide. Yeah, Emma visits Verma and... Yeah, um, I think I will leave it at, at that. That is as much as I think you should know for sure going into this. Now, this, you know, like the first movie, this is written and directed by Ole Bornedale, and it is really it is quite cool that you know this the first movie was actually the first feature film that you know the theatrical feature film that Bonadale wrote and and directed you know he had he had written before he had directed before but none of what he had written or directed was you know theatrically a theatrically released feature film and yeah you know you can really see he knows what he's he when it comes to the technical aspect he knows what he's doing in that first one but he has definitely grown as a director in the the 29 years you know he has 20 credits as director and 22 as writer, though some of those are like shorts, episodes of TV series, you know, various stuff, but yeah, there's been, yeah, um, I realize that it is blasphemy to, as a Dane, admit, but yeah, um, his two Nightwatch films and 1864 are the only things I've seen that he's written and directed. I haven't been avoiding him, Well, I wasn't avoiding him before 1864, but... Yeah. No, seriously, I, I would like to watch other of his stuff. I don't watch a lot of Danish stuff anymore. Now... Let's see... The... Yeah. Um, I don't think that the first... Nightwatch, you know, had that great of a balance between the pensive drama and the grisly horror. And overall, I think this movie does at least a little bit better. And I would definitely say this one is a horror movie. The first one, it's essentially, like, I don't... I've seen a couple of Danish movies do this, where they, they have more than one idea for a really interesting movie... And instead of settling on one, kill your darlings when you're writing. Not otherwise, you will go to prison. But yes, the the this one did feel like they had, you know, it it feels like they looked at the first one and they were like the thing that really the thing that people want more of is the horror. You know, and it, it would definitely also, if it would feel very weird to just make another one that was very similar. The first one is very of its time. Like, there was a degree of, like, cynicism and nihilism in the first one, and that's just not quite... I will grant, there is a certain, you know, percentage of the population that are very doomer. And I don't just mean, like, Danish. I mean, you know, here in the West in general... It's not quite the the same, yeah, to today. So it would feel really weird if it was just the the same. There are a couple of times where the film kind of tries for that 
Like, it definitely wants for the young characters to be jaded and, you know, s you know, I was going to say immature, but I suppose that is actually just, yeah, when you're, when you're young, you're, you're immature. I know I was. Now, the, let's see, right, so yeah, the, the trailer makes this one look like a bigger, faster version of the first one, which I think is exactly the way to go. It, yeah, it has the morbid humor, the psychological trauma, the soundtrack, using licensed music that appeals to young people, the tension, the half-hearted attempts at meta-narrative a la Scream. Obviously, Scream has roughly 20 times more of this commentary, and it is focused and has a clear purpose. An atmosphere, the exploration of young people struggling with maintaining the immaturity that they have until recently been allowed to indulge in, and maturing, which I would definitely say that theme, the, the conflict between maturation and staying immature, that felt completely central to a lot of the first film here not quite as much it kind of feels like it's there because it was there in the first one like it feels more like this one is interested in what does it do to a family when something traumatic happens and you know, that's a very logical place to take it, and of course the first one wasn't going to do that. That, You know, the first one is more this sort of thing of, like, you know, what what is that saying? Um, wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. You know, something horrible happening to someone who didn't at all try to get, in, at least not into that kind of trouble, where this one is much more trying to grapple with the long-term effects of trauma and that is definitely something like it's definitely a an interesting thing to explore this thing of the conflict between maturation and staying immature that the first one does and and other films have done i do think that it is more interesting and it does feel more mature you know Bonadale himself, uh, let's see, right, he was 35 when the first one came out, so, you know, and, and, yeah, this is 24 years later, he himself has perhaps matured more, and, let's see, yeah, and, and one of the ways that it's a soft reboot, the new protagonist is very similar to the protagonist of the original, and, here, you know, this isn't, the following is not always the case with, you know, soft reboots, but, you know, the, the, often the, the situation, the circumstance will be somewhat similar, but here they're actually related by blood. And, let's see, I don't really think that the movie overall sold, the, the moment that I saw the subtitle, like, you know, I heard, oh, there's Night Watch 2, sounds good, and they even do this thing. Uh, yeah, you can you can sort of see it. In, it's, it's there in the trailer, you can sort of see it in the in the poster that's on IMDb. The, the, oh, hold on, wow. I, I need sleep. No, you absolutely cannot. This is, yeah, wow. Anyway. In the Danish word for Night Watch, there are two N's. The N at the end turns into a two. Yeah, you know, the, the uh, English one sort of does it with the H in Night Watch. That's, that's a kind of neat little... Yeah. But the... Yeah, I don't think having the word demon in the title, like... Yeah. There, you know, there's nothing in the first one that would work for that. Like, I probably wouldn't have guessed the sequel would have had that in the title. Like, if you told me there's a Danish horror movie coming out, it's called Demons Are Forever, I would never think, oh, they're making a second Night Watch. You know, I'd be like, oh, I thought they already did, you know, The Kingdom Season 3. Real. You know, so, so yeah, just, I don't know. It, it, 
yeah. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, and the the song from the first movie when Kalinka finds the body of Joyce, you know, returns as seen in the trailer. I I did not know before watching the trailer for this. Though apparently, okay, he's been in a bunch of stuff, so I should have known. Apparently Denmark has a Dane Dehan. So I guess it's pronounced Alex Hu Anderson. He plays Frederick and he's dating Emma and just like the the resemblance is striking. And let's see, I think that pretty much So yeah, the the fact that the protagonist is played by the daughter of the writer director is not in and of itself automatically a bad thing. It does technically qualify as nepotism, but like many other cases of nepotism, this does not mean that the person is actually unqualified. Um, I I'm not super familiar with her, which I suppose is obvious since I don't watch a lot of the Danish stuff anymore. She was in 1864. She's a time traveler. No, the the miniseries 1864. I thought she did quite well there. She's one of the most memorable, you know, and, and, like, she's surrounded by, like, really, really famous actors, so it's very impressive. She was given some really great material. Um, yeah. She played Inge at 11, who, yeah, just, she really, she... Um, I think it's maybe also just the fact, like, the, f I think it's the first scene she, she has, she's, like, shouting, you know, like, there's these boys who are all, like, uh, oh, no girls allowed, this is boys club, you know, kind of bullshit, and she, like, shouts at them, and is all, like, this is a free country, I get to play where you get to play, and just, yeah, she's, you know, very, very winning, you know, just, yeah. Now, the, let's see, um, yeah, there is this weird thing where there's a sex scene, now, but I had heard that there would be a sex scene, I thought that it would be, like, more of one, it is essentially, like, you don't really see much of anything, it's just, you know, they get undressed, and then it cuts to after, I was a little worried, the first movie does not have a sex scene, but it does have a post-coital scene. And I will acknowledge that there are movies that definitely do need sex scenes. There are movies where a sex scene can convey something, but it's not really the case in either of these movies, so I'm glad that it is just, you know, but yeah, it is kind of weird that her father wrote and directed her to be in a sex scene, considering how many fathers hate the idea of seeing their daughters o face. It's just kind of weird. I mean, I guess it's possible there was a second unit for that scene. Just hoping. I was personally quite happy with the amount of fan service, nostalgia, and references to the original. And let's see. I think that might be about... Yeah, so um, much like the, the first film, there are some references to like classic horror and yeah um like the the first one i so yeah in the first one some of the you know the, the scares don't tend to come from things that happen this one does a little bit more with that some some really really scary stuff does happen but in with both of these movies you know a lot of the scare the, the, what's scary is the technical aspects flickering the, yeah in the first one there's flickering lights in this one i i quite appreciate this because it would have been really boring if they just did the same thing but no in the first movie when he's walking down the halls of the you know where the the 
I, I'm not 100% certain what to call it in English. Uh, cor coroner area. Yeah. Um, you know, morgue. He's walking down the, the hall and the lights flicker on. You know, they're, they're motion sensor kind of based. Here, they just straight up say, we turn off the light. You need this flashlight. And so she's walking with the flashlight and that's, you know... And let's see. Yeah, and the otherwise dim lighting. Oh, right. Forensic department, I guess, is what it's called. Yeah. The the tense music. I think this one does perhaps slightly overuse at least. The air raid siren. I it felt a little distracting to me, though I suppose I'm not sure it actually is more aggressively used than the Evil Dead remake. And it worked for me there, so I don't know. I I know. That movie is, like, operatic. You know, it's an Evil Dead movie. This is not an Evil Dead movie. This is a serial killer movie. And Air Raid Siren is just a tad too much for, for one. You know, nobody's being possessed by Kandarian demon spirits. You know, it's just not quite there. But yeah, uh, yeah, both of these movies have, you know, get scares from the enjoyably over-enthusiastic sound design, the camera work, and editing. And yeah, this one goes for a bit more, like, in the, in the kills department. It's not like a huge body count, but it is more. And let's see... Yeah, yeah, the first one does not seem that interested in the serial killer so much as using the serial killer to explore nihilism and cynicism. And the, yeah, and these themes are also explored in The Game of Dare, which the first movie has about equal interest in as the killer. This movie does not have a Game of Dare or anything really quite like it, which I, I wouldn't mind an entire movie of the game of dare but to have the game of dare and the serial killer in the same movie just really does not feel i i honestly don't quite know what bonadale was was going for it kind of feels like he was mostly interested in it, yeah yeah i i did read that he wanted to see if danes could make a genre film like an American kind of, you know, and, and yeah, it does feel a bit like, oh, he was just checking it out. You know, it is, it's an experiment more than a passion project. I definitely felt his heart was in the game of Dare and these kind of, you know, I, I rewatched it just uh, a couple of days ago. You know, you can definitely tell he he was interested in the way that this, you know, yeah. The, the, um, I think I have said all that I wanted to about that. Now, uh, let's see. So the opening of the film is okay. I don't think that it was quite as effective as it was clearly meant to be. Um, I think the film picked up very shortly after that, but honestly, the first scene just wasn't quite that, like, yeah. Um, I don't think that it's... Yeah, in that regard, the first one is the, the better of the two films. Now, the ending has some things that I really love. It also has some things that I did not really think made perfect sense. Um, I suppose overall I will say the... yeah. Um, I thought that it was mostly good.
I'm just gonna real quick note. Uh, There we go. Just realized there was something I wanted to say about the ending that I can only say with spoilers. So I'm noting it to say in the spoiler section, the first spoiler section. Now, the. Yeah, I, it did not feel like the ending really betrayed the, the rest of the movie. And that's. You know, sadly, that happens in a number of horror movies. So, Emma and Frederick have these friends, Sophus and Maria. And, yeah, um... I saw at least one person say this is definitely they're they're supposed to be the new version of like the the yeah what's the word they're they're supposed to be the new versions of Jens and Lord from the first movie the the friends of Martin and Kalinka and it's definitely I don't think the film the, the characters would have been in the film if not for the film doing the soft reboot thing. I think this movie would probably have made more sense. Yeah. The the um, There's this thing. The movie brings up the idea of the yeah, as, as part of the exploration of, of trauma, of, of what it does to a family to, to have something traumatic happen, part of that exploration is the fact that Kalinka committed suicide, and there's a fear that maybe Emma will commit suicide. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, but why? She doesn't... Like, she seems to get along with her friends. You know, she doesn't feel like... This is a... It's a theme that would make more sense and feel more... natural if she was alone a lot. And I certainly get... I, I get why... Live, why trying to take care of her father makes her sad. You know, Martin is in a pretty sorry state, which apparently some I I don't really I've I've tried. I swear I've tried. I don't understand why people who who see these characters for the first time in like thirty years or more, why do you want to see them just be happy? Then there's nowhere for them to go. Like I get if you're unhappy about one of these movies, a soft reboot ending with that character still miserable, but why would you want to see them in the exact same place as they were the last time you saw them if it's been a generation? I just, I don't understand it, but whatever. Some people feel that way, I don't feel that way. I thought it made perfect sense for Martin to be very distraught about it, you know, and, and yeah, I absolutely get from the scenes between the two of them, that made sense. But then you have these other scenes where she's with like she's with Maria and Sophus, and it's like, I, what, why is she, like, upset? Like, I, I, I could, see, here's what I would have done. If I were writing, I would have had something where she expresses sadness and the others make fun of her for it. But it seems like she just doesn't even really try to... Yeah, it just... It's the kind of thing where, like, on the one hand, Bonadale gets, you know, well, part of the first film was the, the group dynamic, and, you know, young people who go to movies like to see several young people, not just one, 
or two. And then on the other hand, he's telling a story where our protagonist is so sad that the concept of her taking her own life comes up multiple times. And he does. this is where you have to sacrifice one of these two. Because the movie that we end up with just doesn't, it does not completely jive. Like, the first movie, it made perfect sense that there was this relationship. Because all four of them were struggling. With, you know, the two women were significantly more mature than the two men. But that is, you know, so goes the stereotype. The, the thing there is they're still dating these men that they admit, wow, these guys are not super mature. So there's still a conflict there. But here, it's like she's either sad when she's with her father or by herself, and she seems perfectly fine when she's with her friends. So, that, like, I get it. I'm not saying that no sad people actually have friends. I'm not saying that all friends listen but it seems like she's not even really giving them much of a chance to and it just yeah I, I don't know it it did not really I, I didn't think that it was the right way to go for for this um I did personally think that each of them gave a a good performance like it felt like honestly I would say every every actor it felt like they were delivering what was being called for you know what was what they were called upon to to deliver the the let's see um like you know for sure sofus very weird but that's the character you know other characters call it out that he's being very weird now, let's see, yeah, um, I quite appreciate Maria, um, I'm not, I, th I think this might be more of a Danish thing than an American thing, so I don't know, you know, I, I don't even know if this is gonna, like, I get, you know, you could, like, subtitle this or, God help me, dub it, and, and have Americans, you know, it has elements that Americans would uh, quite appreciate, I think the character of Maria, I think that's more of like, there's a, there's a lot of, of young Danish women who are very much like that. You know, she's not really this like delicate flower. She's very, very rough around the edges, you know, yeah, um, when I was, you know, a teenager. I, I met, you know, teenagers who were a lot like her. So that, that did feel very, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And that's something, you know, like I just mentioned, in the first film, it's very much, oh, you know, guys are kind of, you know, not super mature, but women, they're very mature for, you know, they're, they're much more, they're way ahead of, you know. And then we have this movie where, like, it's, the the two young women are not especially more mature. They're they're also very like harsh and yeah, you know, they're teenagers. They're they are twenty somethings, I guess. They're you know, they're young. The so so this yeah, I guess they must I honestly, I'm not entirely sure how what the age range is for because they're like in like college kind of thing. They're they're med med students. Now let's see. I think that is Yeah, um the cinematography does quite a good job. There's some choice shots where they really like they something will be just in the background of a shot maybe moving just slightly but the character has their back turned to the camera so they don't see it you know and yeah the the, the cinematography does a good job capturing the the 
yeah, the the atmosphere and the editing is also quite good now. Let's see. So the Okay, the the budget is estimated to be 4.3 million euro. And I definitely do think, you know, it you can tell that this wasn't made for like almost nothing. It does feel like money was was put into it. And there is some some quite good location shooting. They yeah, for the psychiatric hospital they actually did film at a hospital and let's see yeah there's something in uh, a church that was also filmed in an actual church instead of having to build a set and let's see I think that might be about <coughs> Hmm. And I do think that this is the the kind of thing that you know not not everyone will love it, but I can imagine it it will definitely have an quite an audience. You know, it's it's slightly early to say because it's a very recent movie. Um, you know, I meant to watch it on you know the the premiere day but stuff came up and yeah the the um, I think it has a, a chance be, at, at being a crowd pleaser there are a lot of things about it that feel you know like I I would argue it, it will do better than if they just tried which actually I think they might did they anyway if if they just put the first one in theaters you know that would definitely get a, a lot of the people who watched it when it first came out and they would bring some people and recommend it to some people but this one feels more like you know in in part because of this thing of like the the gender dynamic being yeah uh, yeah, the the sound design. I don't think I want to give it away. I will just say there is one very specific sound choice here that I really loved. I, I will talk about it in the spoiler section, but I it's, yeah, it's very clear. Bonadale still really has an ear for the kind of sounds that really just get under your skin. That just really freak you out. So the movie is one hour and 57 minutes if you don't count the end credits. I did not stay through the end credits. I did not really have much of a reason to think that there was like a, a post credit scene or something along those lines which you know yeah and and Google was no help in answering the question so I just took my chances and left. Actually, no wait, yeah. There wasn't the the by the by the time I left the movie theater, the end credits had actually run. There was I had to wait briefly in order to to leave. It was fairly packed. Now, as far as political goes, you know, this one does have some like progressive stuff you know it's it certainly doesn't have anything as repulsive as the the restaurant scene in the first movie the the but there are other times where it does like characters will say even do really offensive things so yeah that that is something i will say you know i don't If this, you know, goes to, to America, if, if a lot of Americans watch it, there will definitely be some articles talking about, which it's possible that there are here in Denmark as well. I'm not as 
it's I, I honestly don't know enough about where our politics I don't actually I can't really explain why uh, when I was a teenager I cared a lot about Danish politics today I mostly pay the when I pay attention to politics which I do a lot it's mostly American politics but yeah it's possible that there will be maybe even our articles about some of the insensitive stuff. I'll, I'll talk about some of what I picked up on in the in the spoiler section. So the the best elements <clears throat> the the young characters felt quite real. I thought it was quite scary the the when it tried to be scary, which is more frequently than the first one, it mostly works. I, I would say there's maybe a little bit that didn't completely work, but yeah. Um, yeah, the worst aspect for me is these couple of things where it was very insensitive. I have not read very many... I, I meant to, I just didn't quite get around to. Mo mostly when I read reviews of movies, it's in English and there just haven't been very many. I meant to read the ones that are in Danish but yeah it got away from me and let's see yeah the th what I was most worried, worried about in this film was the banes of Danish films bad writing and things either having zero consequence or excessive consequence and unfortunately there is definitely some of that. There are things where you really feel like, wow, the, like, Bonadette is like an adult, right? He's not like a 12-year-old who just likes to imagine doing these various things. Like, there's, there's some stuff that really feels like it was written by someone who has no idea how... Like, I guess it's possible he just didn't research these things at all, but just, yeah. Now, the yeah, the stuff I was most looking forward to was the cast and the direction, and yeah, I was quite happy with those. The trailer definitely gives too much away. Um, it is one of those things, it's difficult to get audience interest without spoiling. And if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. The cover and poster do not give too much away and do give a pretty good idea of what the the movie is like as much as you can with a single image. And yeah, um, Rotten Tomatoes does not have anything for this and it doesn't even... Yeah, on on Metacritic, it, there isn't even an entry for it. There is for the first one, but oh wait, no, that's right. It doesn't even have no. It's you know when you do a search for Night Watch on Metacritic, it finds the American remake. I I don't know if that was meant as a slap in the face, but it felt like it. It that stings, man. Seriously, that was. Did they just did, did they have a really bad Danish that morning or something? Now the let's see. Yes. The the um, on IMDb uh, yeah, currently there's only one user review and it has spoilers and Let's see. Yeah, um, I don't really have anything to say about that review. Now, the um, yes, the votes, it only has 258 votes so far, ending up at a rating of 6.4 out of 10. 24.4% gave it 7. 
16.38 gave it 8, 15.9 gave it 10, another 15.9 gave it 6, 10.1 gave it 5, 4.3 gave it 9, another 4.3 gave it 4, 3.9 gave it 3, 3.1 gave it 2, 1.9 gave it 1. And right, and the, the only IMDb user review right now gave it a 7 out of 10. And there's also currently only one external review, which I did think was was good. I'll I'll link it in the description box. There we go. Now that pretty much covers Right, right. The the special effects were convincing. They were not the most like daring, but you know, yeah, it, it worked. The yeah, there's some good stunt work, and I did appreciate, you know, there's a little bit more violence than the first one, which really like I think it's you know there are things about the first that absolutely work. I wouldn't have hated if it had at least a little bit more violence, but I think it's largely a, a budget thing. And the sound design does a lot to help make up for it. Now, the... I think that's as much as I want to say about the violence before I get into spoilers. So, yeah, um, I rate this seven fairly satisfying follow-ups out of ten. And I think, yeah, uh, I, th I think it has... You know, I, I hope more people go to, to IMDb. Like, I, I sincerely doubt that only 258 Danes in total have watched it. You know, um, yeah. That might be about... Yeah. So, let's get into the spoilers. So, yeah. From here on out, I am spoiling absolutely everything in this movie. Starting with notes taken while watching, so these are largely going to be chronological. On the pad of paper, as usual. So, yeah, we open in the interrogation room, and it looked like they were building up to like a one of those like I, recently I keep needing to remember what it's called and I just cannot it's not a time skip yeah it's a it's a montage that shows the passing of time but ultimately they didn't really end up doing that which felt it, it, yeah, it felt like they were going somewhere and then they didn't go there. And we meet... I want to say I like Papa Christine. I've quite liked her elsewhere. And I don't think the... I don't think the performance is her fault. I, as far as I can tell, she gave Bonadette what he was asking for. You know, because... Like, the stuff I've seen her in, she's so completely different from how she is here that, yeah, it just doesn't. There's three Ant Boy movies now? Holy crap. Like, I vaguely remember hearing about one. I didn't know they kept making them. I guess someone really likes them, if they're still making them. I guess even us Danes can make, you know comic book franchises with when it comes to movies. Yeah, I thought she was great in The Celebration or in Danish Festen. Loved her in that. I mean, everyone's great in that. Everyone's amazing in that movie. Uh, you know, but no, the the just yeah. Um 
Uh, I guess that might be about... Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to, to be talking about, about her previous work. But yeah, um, yeah, Kama is the name of, of her cop. I... Sometimes when you watch Danish movies and TV, it just feels like, okay, this is... You've watched a lot of American stuff, and you're kind of just, like recreating some of the, like, she's she's the rogue renegade cop who gets results, damn it, and it's just, like, I don't, I'm not saying that no movie can have a character like that, I'm saying two minutes into the movie, like, the first couple of lines, like, immediate, you know, she says some, you know, really insulting stuff to Bent, and then it goes to the other cop, and he's like, Damn it, you can't say that. You know, just like, okay, we get it. You've you've watched a lot of American propaganda. It's, it's, you know, I enjoy a lot of that, too. I get it. I just, yeah. And, let's see. Um, yeah, and we have the, yeah, they talk about, you know, the, the other cop is like, how could you let out Bent? Which, it's one of those things, I forget if I ever said it on camera, but something I found myself thinking some years back is that one of the reasons that Danish rap might struggle, which, you know, I, I, I've said it before, Tessa, the, the current rapper, she's great. She... You know, I, I really admire her stuff, but the, the, yes, I know I'm too old, too. The, the, back in the early to mid-2000s, Danish rap was not of quite as high quality as Tessa, and I can imagine other current, you know, I, I remember once, years ago, finding myself thinking, because one of them, you know, one, one of the, the Danish rap songs that I've heard, you know, one of the first lines is one of the rappers saying, or, or maybe it's after one verse, whatever, one of the rappers says, now you, Rasmus, and I found myself thinking, this is why Danish rap doesn't work, because some of the rappers might be named Rasmus or Niklas. Or various, like, these words, th th these names that are fine if you're just, like, I, I, I can abide by a pop star named Rasmus, but a rapper, that's, it's just not a cool name. Like, to at least change it, like, call yourself Ray, you know, or, or RM, RS, anything else, you know, and, yeah, I, I don't think that calling a serial killer bent is very intimidating. I think that it would have been good if, like, there are Dane, Danes named John, you know, call, call him something that sounds just a teeny tiny bit more, more intimidating. Like, I don't hate, like, apparently the, so, yeah, by the end of the movie we realize that the psychiatrist is the, the, yeah, I guess she is the serial killer because Bent doesn't actually hurt anyone other than himself. The, the, you know, her name is Gunva. That, I think, works. I, I, you know, I'm not terrified of it, but I'm not laughing at it either, which, like, I'm sorry, Bent is not a very intimidating name. But, but yeah, the, the, you know, the cop is like, how could you let Bent out? And, you know, the, the, and, and Gunva is like, oh, but, you know, He's he's the most peaceful and and this kind of thing and just yeah I'm I'm really not a fan of when movies and TV shows imply that the the mental health you know mental health professionals can't tell if someone is dangerous dangerous and shouldn't be released or not and just yeah really felt like they were heading in that direction and yeah so we we realize you know bent is 
delusional and he killed the priest which is also like I I mean they also have in the trailer making it pretty clear that that's what's going to happen I guess they just did not have any intention of keeping it at all a secret I don't personally think that it's necessarily a problem that we're getting a scene from you know, they never actually do the thing where it says, you know, X amount of hours or days earlier, but that is clearly, you know, the, the that scene happens maybe three days after the very next scene. I don't think that's a problem. I don't love that we're told this early, oh, you know, he killed a priest, and that, you know, later we realize, no, he didn't actually kill anyone. You know, so the, yeah, I, I, it just, I don't love that they, yeah, they, they gave that much away, especially because, like, the actual murder of Lotte is extremely important for the rest of the movie, like, that's why Jens comes back, which is a part of why Verma and Gunva wanted it done, you know, that, yeah, it, yeah, because, because, based on the first movie, like, Lotte really didn't do much of anything to Verma, Jens shot Verma, that's what the revenge is all about, she was a means to an end, which brings us back to these, you know, female victims being treated as just disposable by the killer as well as the movie. I don't love this thing of, like, we're told, oh, Bent, you know, he's he's so peaceful, and then, like, you know, he's he's slamming his head against the, the glass and, you know, laughing maniacally, and, and this thing, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's shit like this that gets people to, to, you know, cross the street to avoid being near someone who appears to be mentally ill, you know. In reality, the mentally ill are victims of violence to a much, much higher degree than perpetrators. And I get, you know, I, I understand that it's, you know, there's a there's an expectation for that kind of thing in this, but you really don't, you certainly don't have to lay it on so thick, you know. Now... See, again, if I was making this movie, and I swear my criticisms are not like, oh, you know, bitter, failed filmmaker. I'm not. I'm not like fucking Ben Shapiro or some shit. God, he's so pathetic. Um, no, the the yeah, what I would have done is to have it be someone who sounds like they believe what they're saying, but what they're saying is just such nonsense. Like, some, some, like, a Jordan Peterson vibe. You know, just very soft-spoken, and, and, you know, it almost sounds like he knows what he's saying, but, but then every so often he'll, he'll say that we should all be like lobsters, and it, I know he didn't, I don't think he literally did say that, but it's just like, just something like that, I, I think would certainly be more relevant. I'm not saying that Jordan Peterson is a serial killer, though he definitely does have... He, he, he is responsible for a lot of misery. But neither is the, the, your average mentally ill person, you know. So, yeah, it, it really feels like it just... They, they haven't... You know, sometimes we, our, our media really does not keep up with the times. And this feels like another, like, it, it feels like it's, it's, yeah, maybe 20 years, you know, out of date. If, if, you know, if, if we were to see something, I, I will admit, I don't watch all the American stuff. It's possible there is something like this there, but... Otherwise, yeah, like, you know, something, I, it reminded me kind of like Seven, you know, which I, I get, you know, I think that, I, it's been a long time since I watched it, so I'm not going to say for sure if it's an amazing movie. 
I thought it was amazing when I was like 13. I don't think I've watched it at all since. I haven't been avoiding it. I'd like to watch it again, but that movie was from like what 95 or something. Like, if you're gonna do something, yeah, there's something somewhat similar. There's definitely elements of Seven in the Batman, and that one significantly, you know, decreases the intensity of how othering the the depiction of the the you know the mentally ill is and yeah then we go to Emma and Martin talking about Kalinka's old stuff and this is one of those things like this might be the single best conceived act one scene of the entire movie because right away like before we see anything else like immediately we're seeing Emma going over her mom's old stuff this immediately tells us she is thinking a lot about this and we see Martin being like no, no, no don't touch it don't touch it you know he's acting like you know, because to him, and and I, you know, I'm I'm I say this without judgment. I, you know, I've been there myself. When you miss someone who's died, yeah, you know, you you act like no, if you if you don't don't mess with their stuff because that's you know that's that's all we have left. You know, that really worked. This thing of you know she's trying to move on, and he is is struggling to to even like yeah you know that that was quite yeah and yeah this is the first mention of the fact that Kalinka committed suicide and Emma is worried that she'll end up committing suicide as well which you know starts the the running theme of please do not make a drinking game out of every time someone mentions considering suicide, attempting suicide, worrying that they'll end up either attempting or committing suicide in this movie. You will go into a you know alcohol induced coma. And the the I really felt like it was an interesting place to I I I would have liked if they if they did more with it but yeah it if cuz it it is an interesting idea you know and and the the element of how trauma you know it basically it's like ripples you know in in water and that I th thought worked but them bringing up the suicide did not really go anywhere particularly and that's another thing that I've seen a number of times in Danish films like Danish directors writers and directors watch American movies and realize oh it's good if a movie sets up an idea but they I don't know if they just don't realize you have you have to deliver you have to resolve the idea you know or if they just aren't able to, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, maybe Bonadale thinks he is d delivering on, you know, I, I, yeah. Now, yeah, and, and, yeah, Emma points out, you know, Martin should maybe try meeting someone else. And, yeah, she finds the, the newspaper clippings about the events of the first film and let's see yeah so the the doctor from the first one uh, I'm honestly not entirely oh right right um Battleson I think um yeah you know he yeah he was the one who you know, he, he got the, the, he got fired, um, 
Martin in the first movie. And let's see, yeah, it seems like the actor worked with Bondale elsewhere as well. He's in flickering lights? Wow, I don't remember that. Blink Nelukta for the fellow Danes. I could watch that movie again. It hasn't even been a huge amount of time since I last watched it, but yeah, I just I am not remembering his his character. Um, anyway, but the the yeah um, yeah. So you know he is he's teaching the med students, and we have the the. I appreciate a scene of like, you know, having some fun in the classroom as much as the next guy. I, it felt melodramatic to me. Like, I don't. I I. I think they overdid. The, the there's this, like every so often, there'll be an implication or a or a suggestion in the scene. And every student in the room will go, ooh. And it's like, okay, calm down. Like, I get it. You're in class. This is probably the single most exciting thing that has ever happened in class. But you're overdoing it. It's not that intense, you know. Um, and it's, it's one of those things like, <laughs> yeah, the teacher catches a student cracking jokes and that also like that went on for way too like the the teachers like hmm, cracking jokes well let me just continue my lecture and he goes on for like 30 seconds before he's finally like so what is that joke you're cracking and it's like my god just like ca catch him immediately and have a consequence immediately instead of this like just yeah but but yeah um the the finger sucking joke and and payoff you know was yeah um, amusing and let's see and i do appreciate you know that's a line that i would not change or remove the very next scene when when emma asks so um which finger was it and he's like i didn't put a finger up the ass of don't worry i didn't i didn't risk your your boyfriend actually sucking ass finger you know don't worry but yeah um yeah but the yeah she she approaches the doctor and you know yeah asks about being being night watch and is told you know it's not technically night watch it's what was it emergency yeah you know and yeah they bring up you know, gender, he, he says that, you know, he says something like, is it improper for me to say that I think it's a man's job, not a woman's job? And she jokes that she is offended by that. I do quite appreciate, like, once she actually, the, the, yeah, um, the um yeah once she actually starts on the job she's actually like you know she's like dancing down the hall in order to keep from from being scared so you know i quite appreciate a, a, a horror movie that says no women are not just these you know blubbering messes that that massages like to imagine some are sure but there's also men that are like that and yeah, I don't know. It, maybe it's just me. I felt a little weird to have the finger sucking joke so close to this, you know, gender joke. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, and we're told you know the lights are off from eleven, and the you know if the if the elevator comes up, the red light will glow. And you should never be without a flashlight. The elevator to hell. You know, that that was really great. That was probably 
the the introduction to the the night watch routine was probably the best that any scene that's just supposed to be in in this entire movie th any scene in this entire movie that's just supposed to be like the the soft rebooted version of the scene from the first one uh, you know the the uh, let's see yeah i i am not sure who the yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what the character's name is, unfortunately. But yeah, I I thought she was was great. You know, a very very capable replacement. And of course, they needed a replacement for the for the guy who told Martin about this stuff in the first movie, because that actor has of course passed in the in the meantime. He was you know, quite up in years when they made the first one, and it's been 29 years. And, yeah, I, I like when she, like, she pointed to a place that there's some really fucked up stuff down there. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing where you immediately know, okay, later on someone's gonna go in there. I, I really appreciate that this did not feel the need to try to have a lot of, like serial killing related stuff happen in the actual you know near near the the morgue you know that was like really the only thing is bent kidnapping maria by accident that's the only thing that cuz the the climax of the movie is at the psychiatric you know hospital instead of so that you know it would have felt really forced if somehow it ended up back there again you know it was it was mostly there to harken back to the first one and yeah as you know that they talk about you know the the stuff that happened with Rama and you know Emma's like oh so I th it was a friend of his that that shot that then you know killed Rama I mean shot him what makes you think Rama's dead that was great. You know, I knew it was coming because I watched the trailer, but that was fantastic. That was like a, a turn of of the scene. Just such a, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and she even has the line, I guess it, it would take more to kill him. You know, he went into a coma. Let's see. Yeah, and then we get all the all the 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 four young people together in in one place making you know yeah all of them making jokes and such and I I will say I, I quite appreciated you know Emma calls out Maria and says what do you mean what do you mean that's how it goes who who says and then. You know, Maria's like, what do you mean? They say. And then it goes on a whole thing. And they they worked quite well. They, yeah, the way the, the two of them played off each other, it felt quite real. And I, I quite appreciate, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it's not, I don't, I, I don't think it's supposed to be like a, a trans or non-binary thing, but Maria is less like traditionally feminine than you know yeah she she's not extremely feminine and the movie never makes her out to be bad for not being super feminine you know no one is like criticized like she gets criticized for other stuff you know but no one ever says why why are you being so, so you know so masculine all the time or you know neutral and yeah we get some quite offensive jokes between the the friends and let's see yeah and and um now that i think about it wait did did she mention to the friends the thing about 
yeah, actually, I think she brought it up, but it just didn't, it neither went in the direction that I suggested in the review of, you know, maybe they make fun of her and that's why she feels so alone about it, but they also don't go in the other direction and have, like, like, clearly it doesn't quite seem to help, or at least not enough, because she's still really thinking about, yeah, it just, it, it, it didn't feel like, based on the, the way that, yeah, you know, some, something that would have worked is if the others had really struggled to, to empathize with her, if they, like, maybe meant well, you know, I, I recently rewatched the, the excellent movie that I, I did a video on it a little while back, let's, ah, what was it called, well, I know who's in it, let's start with that, so, Rebecca Hall, and the movie is called The Night House, from 2020, you know, that one, you know, <clears throat> that was a really solid exploration of what grief does to a person, and it's very consistent throughout, throughout the entire movie, she is always behaving in a way that feels natural for someone who is deep in, in mourning, you know, and yeah, there's a, there's a fairly early scene where she, you know, she's with some of her colleagues, and they're like, it's after work, they're, you know, trying to relax in, in, let's see, I guess, I think it's, it's maybe a club or a bar or something like that. And, you know, she brings up her her dead husband. And the others, you know, it's clear that they've been friends for a long time. And they're trying to, to help. One of them does make, you know, they catch themselves. But they do accidentally say something that's very insensitive. But it's very clear that the fact that they are trying to help is not enough and that was not quite the vibe I got from from this movie it didn't feel like the just yeah I because the yeah the big difference in that movie in that scene it kills the mood like nobody wanted her to bring up her dead husband and you know the, to be talking about this you know they, they want her to be okay but they, you know, yeah, and and there is a there is an aversion to talking about grief in Western culture, and and in this movie, Night Watch Two, it just kind of felt like I mean they're they're trying, you know, it's it seems like it's okay. Not none of them are acting like she just torpedoed the entire experience. You know, which in in both of these movies, it's not that the protagonist is meaning to, but that's what grief does. You know, and let's see. I also wasn't entirely clear on is this the first time she's talking to them about this, and if so, why? And if not, why doesn't it? Because it doesn't. I I didn't really get the sense that they're like, oh my god, this again, which. I mean, apparently it's been a while since, yeah, as far as, as far as I understood from the movie, it's been a while, and that's why Emma is like, why do you still have all of Mom's stuff right here? Why is the, you know, yeah, it must have been at least a little while in order for, for him to be, for, for her to think, why didn't you find someone else? Can't exactly have been last week. Yeah, and later they say, yeah, you know, because Jens was in Thailand for 20 years, and there was the thing about, you know, the the suicide happened after he left. So, yeah, yeah, because they say that she found, Emma found Kalinka dead when she was younger. Yeah, that's, it. it's one of these things, like, if... If something so significant is, you know, happening at the start of the movie, then why? Why is it happening now and not then? You know, and I mean, maybe this is the first time that she's found her mom's stuff in all these years, 
but I didn't quite that that didn't really come across to me you know it's just it's just another room of the of the house like yeah it's and yeah we see that you know Martin is a mess he's on pills he doesn't listen to what Emma says he tries to prepare dinner but doesn't start the oven you know which I will say later on when he was like you know I I made dinner I actually started the oven this time got to put the dinner in first but I'm getting there it's it's progress it's improvement but yeah there's the thing about you know this guy he knew called Jakob you know he died three times but they kept starting his heart and he kept telling them not to and he said you know maybe we should have heart stop machines as well to you know so that you don't make a mess of the the train tracks when you wanna go out you know and yeah that also just felt I mean this is just earlier in the movie you know she was like so how much you know who do I remind you most of you or, or mom and he's like oh you know you got the best from both of us uh, you are 95 percent mom five percent me and then you know she says well you know maybe you know maybe suicide is genetic and he says that's the five percent you have from me and now he's making jokes about suicide it's just it doesn't make sense it does like even if you want to say oh it's like it's the the pills why wasn't he on pills in the earlier scene apparently he's on pills all the time what prompted him to take more pills this time this is before he finds out that she has the night watch job you know so it's just yeah it's it's these things like danish danish writers and directors understand that over the course of the movie it's important to increase the intensity but they maybe they I don't know if they don't understand or they just don't quite manage to but they don't quite manage to make it you know yeah part of the the actual plot you know that again the the movie seven is a good you know that one does a quite good job over the course of the movie you know you can understand why several of the major characters I'm not going to be spoiling that movie here but several of the major characters experience things where you're like oh that's why it's more intense now and yeah Martin doesn't really function he doesn't want to face reality and then you know the place that was said to be haunted you know she hears screams and that's the place where Kelinka and Martin were attacked by Verma. It sounded like they were using. It it might have been like um, the audio from the the screams from the first movie, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, Sophie Koppel isn't credited, but I'm also not seeing anybody else credited with delivering those screams in the in the credits on IMDb and let's see yeah and and she yeah she comes to the door of Falik and, and you know offers and and says you know what what would you prefer sex or croissant and yeah, he asks, you know, can I have both? And let's see. I don't know why that just that kind of reminded me of that scene in um, in Love Actually, where Kira Knightley shows up and is like you know would you like any of this uh, you know dessert and just I don't think I want to give away exactly what happens next because it cracked me up the first time I watched it but yeah and and yeah then we have yeah uh, he asks 
if she's sure she consents and they make a joke out of it because yeah you know it's especially creepy that this is the scene where apparently the the director is directing his own daughter to strip naked and and you know look another actor in the eyes and say yeah I definitely want to fuck like just yeah it feels like one of those things of like guys who are really resistant to the me too movement and such just like you know yeah just I mean, at least she does, you know, the, they, they don't have the scene go on without her consent, so that's something at least, it's just, yeah. I mean, I, I think some of these people just don't even understand, like, if the woman initiates it, Yes, that means she's given her consent. Like, it's not about, you know, oh, sex can't happen unless the guy asks, do you consent? And the woman says yes. Like, if if the woman initiates, it would be the guy who has to, you know, confirm that he's giving his consent. It's just, yeah, some... some... So that's the thing. Like, if you're going to make a joke out of, like, I, I get a... You know, I'm I'm not saying every joke like that is is wrong, but if you're gonna make a joke like that, you should probably understand why. Like, just yeah. Anyway, so honestly, at first I thought that it was because she was just thinking about her dead mother, and you know, sex is life affirming. But I guess it was so that he would agree to help her meet Vama, which. Just yeah, kind of kind of gross misogynistic stereotype. This thing of you know women give sex only so that men will give them something in return, as if women couldn't possibly enjoy sex. Which again, just gonna put out there: if you're a guy and you legitimately you're convinced that a woman does not want or enjoy sex. You're kind of telling on yourself. That's not that's not a woman thing. That's a how women respond to you thing. And yeah, uh, Emma tells if I, you know if I, like, I I quite like the line. You know, she she asks him, "Were you a wanted child?" Which like, I mean, how many how many crimes could he possibly commit? as a child, but no, he's, he says, you know, nothing happens in my family that isn't, you know, 100% planned, you know, that, that's a good line. I, I kind of wanted to know more about his, his character and background based on just, yeah, I, th I thought that was a, a good little detail there, that that's how, yeah, um, but the, the, yeah, um, Emma was not wanted, and, you know, her mother got very honest when she got drunk, and she was also very paranoid. And... Let's see. Yeah, and then we have the thing of, you know, that's apparently... Um, yeah, this is the second... This is the second scene where someone says it about Verma. In, you know, earlier it was bent just talking about Verma, you know, and and now Emma says it quoting um, Kalinka. So, yeah, that's the... I think that's what the, the thing with the demon, you know, the word demon in the title is, you know, it's supposed to imply that there is this, but it just, like, I can appreciate, I'm not saying it has to be literal, I wasn't, you know, confounded at the fact that there's no supernatural presence in the movie, it's fine to, to invoke the concept of demons and simply use it metaphorically, not literally, but it just, 
I, I don't think it completely worked. And yeah, uh, Emma says the only way Kalinka could escape her paranoia was hanging herself. And she says, I was the one who found her. And yeah, uh, she said, you know, I, I want to see. I want to see Verma at St. Hens, and then she says, you know, as she asks, will you help? And he says, no, and then smash cuts, and I thought, you know, oh, that's, that's, like, the, the joke. They're doing the, the thing of, like, you know, you have a, yeah, you have a setup, and then the opposite happens visually at the end of the smash cut, but then they also do it verbally, which, again, just makes me think, like, I, does does Bonadale not understand how? Because it just feels like if you do the same exact joke twice in a row, you know you can't really expect both of them to to land that because because it is the exact same joke. It's just a slightly different delivery. You know, right after the the let's see for yeah, you know he says no, he won't help. Smash cut, he is helping. And then you have the line about, you know, yeah, he says something like, so what, do you, we had sex just so I would help you? I'm just your your sex slave that you use. And then she says, if you help me, we can screw again. And then he helps. And it's just, that was the, wasn't that the joke that you just did? It just, yeah. Um... Yeah, and so they, they, yeah, he calls in order to get, to, to arrange for her to have a meeting with Verma, and I, I think they're claiming, yeah, as, as far as I can tell, he's claiming that he is the, the doctor who teaches them, that, that we saw, you know, the, the asshole finger sucking doctor. That's actually that is that is his full title. He has that on on ID cards and legal documents. And yeah, a uh, good scene as the the guard, I guess. Or okay, it's according to the. I think, yeah. This says he's a. No wait, no. That's got to be a different character then. Right? Or is it... Because this says cop. Yeah, whatever. Um, the guy, you know, tells her about Vatma. That's also a pretty good scene. And, yeah, we're told, you know, Verma isn't dangerous. And by the end of the movie, it's clear that the reason that people think that is that you know the the danger that he still poses is you know it's it's the um it's Gunva who you know helps carry it out so he appears to not be dangerous and yeah we're told that light hurts him and he's blind now and we get couple of shots that make it clear that Bent is close by. And I will say, um, so I have not seen Ulf Pigor in much of anything recent. Like, almost everything I know of him is, is some years back. You know, um, he did really, really great work here. And he was... Like the the when she's upsetting him with the light, the noise that he emits, like holy crap, that was just like ugh, really really effective. Um, yeah, I I wonder if that's the noise that the queen makes when she realizes he's about to do. An impersonation of her again, no. Seriously though, um, he does a really solid impersonation of her. It's very, very funny. I think she does in enjoy it as well. She she has a sense of humor about herself. Now, the 
Let's see. Yeah, and she curses, shouts, and spits in his face, filming it for Martin. And then the door is locked, and it's like, just yeah, that was was a. I I I'm not saying that it really makes sense for, and it's never really explained. I mean, I guess Gunva. Does she know? Or maybe this is just what happens if you go into Vatma, that she's, like, made it the rule. You have to lock them in there. Don't ask questions. I'm I'm the person in charge kind of thing. You know, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, her being stuck in there. You know, she's she's trying to open the door. She's shouting. She presses the, the little thing to get him to come and, to, to come and help. And the air raid siren, it's just a little bit too much, though I do I do think that kind of thing can work extremely well. I think it does in the Evil Dead remake, I think... Okay. We all agree that it works incredibly well in Silent Hill 1. Like, I, I'm sorry, if you, if you tell me that you enjoy horror, you've played Silent Hill 1, and you did not think that the air raid siren was an effective part of the soundtrack. I'm just not gonna believe you. That's that's how that's it's that simple. And Verma is in the background, and it is this like, cause yeah, you know, in the in the trailer and in the f film up to up to when we realize that the door is apparently locked, it kind of seems like oh she's gonna do this and then she's just gonna run away. You know, which seems, you know, that's, I, I quite appreciate it. That's a good setup for a scene because you expect, and she expects, this very cheap, easily attained kind of catharsis. She thinks, oh, this is going to be, and, and there's a lot of people who imagine that. Uh, you know, honestly, I think if we're being honest, we've probably all at least once imagined like abusing someone who did something monstrous like murder or rape you know and yeah you know imagine if then you're stuck in the room with the person that you just abused you know so that's uh, yeah and we see her steal from Verma and <sighs> the movie gets kind of ableist with you know he's he's like you know, trying to trying to feel his way, which you know, that's just that, yeah, that's how blind people, you know, they they see with their hands, you know, and yeah, this is something that makes some people extremely uncomfortable, and that's something that you know, I'll I'll admit, when I was a child, I did, you know, yeah, it sometimes made me uncomfortable. That's something you have to work on, you know. I I would like to think that. You know, if I if I encountered a a blind individual today, I would be extremely sensitive to the the situation. You know, and yeah, she is caught, and the issue the the idea of her being arrested is brought up, and the let's see, I appreciate. I think they did a good job with Gunva's first scene here that, you know, yeah, she seems legitimately sympathetic. Uh, you know, the the stuff that she says, you know, she said, well, you know, what about Verma's son? You know, poor him. And I'm, I'm just saying what it looks like from, from his point of view, you know. It sounds like, no, she really is just trying to be, you know, she's, she's explaining it so that... Emma appreciates that what she did was wrong, but the, the, you know, that is also, like, by the end of the movie, it does kind of seem like, well, you know, maybe abusing a, a helpless individual who did something evil in the past, you know, maybe it's not that bad, maybe he deserves it, maybe he deserves worse, you know, kind of thing, so that's also kind of messed up, which, you know, you could easily address, you could have her accidentally abuse the wrong person, you know, so, something like that. But, yeah, you know, in, in this first scene, I was not at all thinking 
she's definitely the serial killer. You know, I was thinking, oh, you know, she makes a really good point. She's which, oh my god, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. Wait, does that mean? Does that mean that we? Uh, Because at the end of the day, let's see, I mean, at the end of the day, he is a serial killer. He was a serial killer in the past, he becomes a serial, well, organizer of serial killer in the present. Is it saying, because that's also the thing, like, there are people who, you know, do actually become better people. So just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, exactly how I feel about it, but yeah. Um, we get some more details. I, I do appreciate this slow, you know, drip feed of information about the circumstances surrounding the the death of Kalinka. You know, we learned that the vacation home was where Kalinka suicided, and Martin treats it like a mausoleum. He hasn't let it change at all. He goes there three times a week to talk to her. I actually thought that the movie would end with you know, maybe it would be revealed that that was where Maria was being kept, or something. How did they find Maria after the... I guess... Okay, yeah, fair enough. You can track someone's phone. Um, yes, we, did, we don't have to see it. Presumably what happened was Emma went to the cops, said, you know, I talked to my, my friend Maria on the phone... She says she's been kidnapped. Track her phone. That's, yeah. That was also a, a good, I like the effect that we couldn't hear every word she said. And the thing that, you know, she she couldn't reach the phone, so she used Siri to, to answer. That was quite good. Little, yeah. And, right, and, and I think the... Is that the same Redknapp? Maybe from, from the first movie makes an appearance. And yeah, we're told, you know, if you disrupt CBT, uh, that could be trouble. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy, not cock and bowl torture. As Anarch, the fellow YouTuber, apparently mistook it for that was that was quite funny let's see i'm i'm not saying that he no you know like he realized right after that and he probably realized it as he was saying he was making a joke but yeah got a laugh out of me the the let's see yeah um and I will say, you know, this thing of, oh, you know, what about Vatma's son, you know? And then by the end of the movie, we learn, no, no, he didn't have a son, he had a daughter. You know, so, like, because we've been sitting there thinking, well, who could be the son of, you know, and then we find out, no, it's it would have to be, uh, you know, a, a woman that, yeah. And... Yeah, and then we get the thing about the um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Falik tells Emma, you know, the the solution is more sex, not just a little more, a lot more sex, and um. Let's see. Right, and the yeah, the idea of of crisis therapy for Martin is brought up, which is also like I think there's maybe a chance that some Danes are gonna watch this movie and gonna be like, you know what, I'm gonna skip therapy if I don't already know the therapist really well, which is not great. And then we have the thing about you know. Um, Maria jokes, you know, no, I'm, I'm not actually sick because of the disgusting stuff we're sitting here doing. It's morning sickness. And, and Sof was just like, who, who, whose baby are you pregnant with? Which is kind of adorable. Like, he, he actually, he thinks, you've been, you've been having sex with other people, you know. Like, no, oh, sweetheart, it's, it was a joke. 
It's just a joke. And yeah, and it was kind of funny. The thing, you know, she the the thing about um, was it, think about your your favorite thing about your favorite meal. You know, and she's like, oh, you know, it's it's starting to work. And he's like, no, no, no I was thinking this. And then you know, she she throws up. And and yeah, um, Felix suggests that they, you know, the two of them start dating, and he's got like a Kinder. Right. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna have to explain that to the to the people who aren't Danish. Um, so Kinder eggs are these chocolate eggs that children buy, and you know you open it, and there's a there's this little thing inside that has a, a toy that you you know some sometimes you'll have to assemble it. I don't know if the kind of ring I haven't eaten a Kinder egg in I don't know 20 years I guess. So I don't know if those are come in Kinder eggs, but I could imagine. Um, it's yeah, and and you know, she's like, you have a Kinder egg collection. He's like, all real men have a Kinder egg collection, which, you know, that's again this thing of you know, maturity versus immaturity kind of thing. And I know the moment that it came up that oh, you know, they've had sex twice. They're not technically dating yet, you know, all the conservative Americans' monocles popped out. But that, yeah, that is the thing. Sometimes we Danes have sex with someone before we start dating that person. It's really not a big deal, you know, it works perfectly well for, for us. And, you know, we're not, we're not as... The, the kind of anxiety that Americans have about sex it's just not, you know, I'm not saying that no Dane has something like that, but it's nowhere near as intense. It's, yeah. And not not for, like, white Danes, I, I would say. Maybe some, but not, yeah. Not quite as common. Um, yeah, and then we get the the scene where, or rather, yeah, then Martin enters the the scene, and yeah, uh, Emma ends up really humiliated. And again, the scene goes on for too long. They push it too far. It's just like the moment that he comes in and he's like rambling, and it's just immediately cut from that to afterwards where, you know, they're talking and she shows him the video. Because that scene is important, and I do appreciate this thing of, you know, he really can't handle the idea of her working this job. You know, it's really messing with his head, you know, it's, and, and we're told, you know, he sold their, their mother's watch and got a lot of money, and he wants to give it to her, but it just goes on and on and on. Like, the scene is at least twice as long as it should be. The, the moment that he shows up and he's like, where's Emma? Oh, she's right over there. You know, just cut to her and she's like, you know, and then smash cut and they're talking. You know, that's all you need because the audience gets it by that point. But it just keeps pushing. Like, the only reason you'd want to push it this far is if you're making like, a, you know, a, a comedy out of it. Or if it's gonna be like the the start of his villain arc or something, you know, but not just yeah, um, yeah. And she shows him the the video on the phone, even hooking it up to the screen so he can really fully appreciate it. And I do really appreciate, you know, just yeah. As soon as you know, he yeah he's seen the video and he's like, "Do you know what you've done?" That was also great, like. Several of the best moments of this movie are when someone just, like, there's this pause and then they say something really dramatic. You know, that is that is something that Bonadale is quite good at in all three of these. You know, both of the movies and in 1864, the, the miniseries, which should definitely have only been a movie and not a miniseries. Like, my God, it was so repetitive. Um, let's see... Yeah, and and Verma talks about hair, and he likes Emma's hair. 
just yeah very very creepy and then he says I want that and you know a mask is made of his face and go to church and yeah the scene between the yeah Lotte and Bent you know it's so I appreciate that Lotte, as a priest, you know, it is this idea of, you know, the, the, yeah, this, this notion that the church is open to everyone. As long as you can walk through the, 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 you know, the doors and not catch fire, the church is welcoming to you, supposedly. And, yeah, she's, you know, the, the, the way he's talking, like, you'll note that her, Lotte's reaction is completely different from Maria's reaction to the way he talks, you know, but it, it ends up being that she's defenseless against, you know, this, this dangerous sociopath because she's a good person. And this is sadly something that a number of horror and action movies do where you know kindness is made out to be a weakness and yeah not a fan and yeah the moment that she she sees the name Vatma written on one of the hands she does yeah that scares her there's way too much where some yeah she or Bent says it in the scene. The, the, why does this is this, it happens in so many Danish movies? Why does she turn around once he said you know he he says something and she like turns around? She's she's already freaked out at this point. She turns around and says, "I'm I'm sorry. Can can you repeat that? I didn't quite. What was that? You know." And it's like, just get out of there. Like I get it. It's 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 just yeah. That's that's not a. Uh, a good way to to handle it and um yeah we see that there's someone in the back seat like the old urban legend you know and that is legitimately it is just very very creepy if if someone's in the back seat of someone's car uh, you know uh, john carpenter made quite effective use of such a thing at least once in his filmography and no, I, I don't think I will be saying exactly when or where. If you know, you know, and if you don't, I do not want to spoil that for you. And she, yeah, she does manage to leave a message on Martin's machine, which, you know, means that it is much more straightforward conveying to, to Jens that, that she died and um, so in the first movie as far as you know having now watched it several times as far as I can tell the reason that Vatma lets in Martin on the the scalping you know necrophile serial killer is that from the moment they meet Vatma sees someone he can frame. You know, he sees this young kid who doesn't really understand, you know, he's he's never, he's not part of this world yet, so he's, he can, he can mold him, he can make him into a, an effective mark for, for this, you know, and in this movie, I guess that's supposed to, we're supposed to think that Katma is the new Vatma, which I will say is a decent, you know, I appreciate that misdirect because, you know, in some, some of these, like in the sequel, well, the killer will be the, not necessarily the same exact person, but the new person who has that job or something along those lines. And yeah, the, you know, this scene kind of made me think, I guess maybe she really is the new, you know, but 
now that I've watched the entire movie, and I know she definitely did not have anything to do with it, Gunma would not have killed her if not, uh, yeah. Um, why? Why does Katma let in Emma? And, and like, after the first couple of, you know, there's a, there's a few exchanges, and then she's like, no, 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 you're not involved in this. Then why did you, why were you talking to her up until this point? And, yeah, we get the detail about fatherless children are 80% more at psych, um, at risk for psychiatric something or other, which honestly I wouldn't rule out. That might be an actual statistic in real life, and that is the you know, Gunva explains this, and you know by the end of the movie you realize, you know yeah, Gunva knew that she could use um, Bent because of you know having this expertise and being able to recognize this in him which I that definitely did feel to me like saying we have to take we have to be very careful with who we allow to have a lot of power over people who are vulnerable to this kind of manipulation so that I quite appreciate and yeah so I think Ah, crap. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what their names were, but there were these two, you know, a, a young, like, I guess she's a nurse, and then a, a cop, and they, like, introduce themselves to each other, and, you know, yeah, nice little flirtatious, and... Yeah, so there's a, you know, there's this parade of, I guess, they're they're the kids from the from the kids de um, department of this mental hospital, and Bent manages to to sneak out among them, and it just. Yeah, it's just, it, it's, I have so many questions, um, but I don't want to be here forever, so let's start with just the fact that I, I appreciate that it is definitely, it is an, it is a striking image that he, you know, he takes this little blade and he like cuts and the blood pours out and he takes the blood and just rubs it all over his face. That is something that again that just it really creeps us out. We don't want to we don't want to see it. And that's why it's effective horror. But he cuts like so much. There's so much blood pouring out and it's like but why, if if he cuts so there's that much blood, why does it stop? Like that's not how the <laughs> The human body does not pump out that much blood from a wound and then just stop suddenly. You know, there was, there was shit like this in 1864 as well. Like, my God, Bonadale, please get a consultant for these things because this is just, it looks cartoonish. You know, just the blood is pumping out. Just, yeah. Um... Why does no one notice, like, it, it doesn't look that much like he's in disguise, you know, just, yeah, I, I, th I think I'm just going to move on, but anyway, you know, they needed some way for him to escape, and it is creepy looking, and yeah, we see him get some tools, that also, I think there was too long between the setup and payoff, from when, you know, we see him get the tools and we see that, oh, he's definitely in the same building. You know, he's he's near the morgue. And then it's, I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe. Maybe that's a bit. I would say it is at least 10 minutes from when we see that he's definitely near the morgue to when he finally actually gets off his ass and kidnaps uh, Maria. You know, it's... <sighs> Yeah, it's one of those things, like, I, if, if he had just edited it slightly, 
so that there's not so much time between the setup and the payoff. I think it could have worked really well. And yeah, the the message that Lord sent. Um, yeah, uh, Martin mentions. Oh yeah, she just called. You know, and he listens to it. And for some reason, Emma really badly wants him to stop listening. And I don't really. I'm not entirely sure what that. Like. It it kind of felt like. Wouldn't it have been him? Because he's the one who can't confront the death of, of his loved ones. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it didn't completely work. I do love, you know, there's a very aggressive knock on the door. And, you know, they, they open the door and there's no one there. And then Jens jumps in and, and gives them a, a huge jump scare. That really felt like the kind of, you know, yeah, that feels completely in congruity with how he was in the first movie. And, you know, like, in his defense, at this point, he has no idea. The, the, oh, wait, no, wait, didn't they say? Because he, they called him because his number was on Lotus Fridge. Yeah, I'm actually not 100% sure if the cops told him or if someone, uh, yeah, anyway, and yeah, he also listens to the message, and we learned that him being too honest, wait, was that a joke, was Martin just saying, because he makes other really messed up jokes, yeah, I guess he's just saying Jens has Tourette's, it's not actually, yeah, I couldn't tell if it was supposed to be a joke. It got a chuckle out of me, but I didn't hear anybody else, so I think I might have misjudged. But when Martin just straight up says, you know, because, cause like, Jens is saying some really messed up shit. And then Martin's like, how long are you sticking around? You know, I was like, because cause he's, you know, the end of that sentence is, because I kind of want you to go right now. Is that, could, could that be arranged? I got money, I sold Kalinka's old watch, I will buy you a plane ticket, I will drive you to the airport, I will, uh, the car broke down, I will carry you to the airport on my back, I want you out of here right now. But apparently, no, he was saying, let's go hang out. And, let's see, yeah. Um, so... Emma told Maria, hold down the fort. I don't want to get fired on account of there not being a night, go night watch here. What Maria heard was, please throw a party. I am begging you. I am on my hands and knees. Throw a party. Get drunk. Play loud music. Invite your guy, my guy. Please, you know. And let's see. And Maria kind of got mad at the, the guys, even though she, like, I'm pretty sure, I mean, she must have invited them, or at the very least, like, if one of them called, she would have had to tell them where she was. Or she, she seemed okay with the party until Emma showed up. And then she's like, guys, what the fuck? I... When I called you and told you that there was a party here, I was being facetious. Can't you tell? Just, that did feel very, like, that's, and that's not a gender thing. That's just, like, a young person caught fucking up, having a party when they were not supposed to kind of thing. Like, suddenly it's everybody else's fault but their own. And Jens sees Lotus' body. Bent is still waiting in the bathroom, and yeah, they go to the restaurant, and Jens talks about how he was a sexual tourist for a while, and talks about attempting and failing suicide, 
And yeah, talks about, you know, he cut off a finger to escape from the cuffs, which is still like, I'm, I mean, it's not just the thing, it's, it's around the wrist. I'm not speaking from experience, but it, as far as I understand, it, it goes around your wrist and you'd have to basically break your wrist in order to, to escape. And, you know, the way, the, the reason that it, you know, yeah, the idea being who's going to break their wrist just to, you know, and, and often you are being watched. There's a cop nearby when you're cuffed. I, I don't think uh, cutting off a finger, no matter the finger, would, would work. But, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so they talk a little. And then Emma says, I can't stay for, for 20 courses. Which is, of course, a joke. Like... No matter how like high class, you know, it's going to there's there's it's not going to be twenty courses. It's going to be forty five minimum. Uh, no, but seriously though, I guess she was really just there for the summary of the events of the first film. I do appreciate, you know, I like when these movies, you know, you you actually you don't need to watch the first movie in order to follow this one. Over the course of this movie, you do get all the the details that you need and yeah um, Martin realizes Verma wanted Jens back in order to kill him for revenge and then despite that he leaves Jens to, to walk by himself just and the thing the thing is, you could have just had him, if he, let's see, what if, yes, as soon as, as soon as Emma has left, Jens, maybe, you know, maybe he goes to the bathroom or something, and then Martin is sitting there thinking, it's so great, you know, maybe, like, talking out, thinking out loud, you know, talking out loud, you know, the, the, the unusual thing of talking out loud, no, thinking out loud, you know, he's like, so great to have Jens back. It's too bad Lord had to die. Wait a second, you know, maybe this means that she was killed to lure him back. And then, you know, he goes into the bathroom to find Jens, maybe, like, Jens snuck out for some reason. He's not being super logical in this movie anyway. You know, but, but... <laughs> The fact that Martin chooses not, or or if Jens snuck off after Martin told him once, you know, but no, it seems like, okay, well, see you tomorrow if you don't get killed. And, yeah, at this point I noted, what is Bent waiting for? Why, why is he not, you know, just immediately going, yeah. Um, and then... <laughs> She listens to I Think You Freaky by... Okay, I'm definitely going to get the, the name of the band wrong. And they didn't like it when Eminem did that. Um, yeah, the... the the, the South African hip-hop group. Uh, Ninja, Yolandi, Visser, and God. Um... I'm not gonna lie, I didn't know anybody still listened to that. Uh, it's from 2012. It is an 11 year old song. Like, I, I mean, I guess that. Yeah, the, the. I mean, it's catchy. I'm not gonna pretend that it's not. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just. We have music. We have access to the most recent music here. You know, this is not fucking Omo. And then we have, if you haven't watched that movie, that movie's really, really good. Don't know why it's called Fucking Old World. It barely comes up. I much prefer the the American title, Show Me Love. That felt much more like it fit the movie. Anyway, um, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, Emma returns and yeah Martin and Jens goes to the the stadium 
for what a lot of young Danish men would call wish fulfillment, not me, I hate soccer, and a lot of Americans would call my worst nightmare. And let's see. Seriously though, um the the yeah, excellent fellow YouTuber or fellow YouTubers, actually excellent. If you want to be mean about it, I cannot believe I'm blanking on. Uh, hold on, I will. I will have it momentarily. Um, so the the um, yes, Kalen Conrad um, just recently did a video um, called "The Audacity of the Gay Conversion Film Audacity." It's an excellent video. Uh, tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just link it below. You gotta watch it. It's it's amazing. Um, yeah, in that video, Kalen makes a, a joke about the the um, the um yeah apparently like conserv American conservative stand up comedians think that so like if if Americans stop playing American football but and started playing soccer instead that that would be like the worst thing ever and it's just like my god I I don't like soccer which I know some people are going to think I must not actually be Danish if that's the case but American football is not like better it's just yeah Let's see, and, and it's one of those things like um, I'm not advocating for something like actually bad to happen, but I think you would find that if you as an American who thinks that soccer is ridiculous, you know, if you said that to the face of a Danish soccer hooligan, they would probably disagree with you quite distinctly. Anyway, the yeah. Um, then Martin brings up suicide. This is a movie that brings up suicide a lot and really doesn't have very much to say about it. And I did not think that I would ever. I I feel. Like, I, I'm almost kind of revolted at myself, but I think this movie actually has too much intercutting. And I, I it sounds ridiculous, because I love intercutting. I think it is an incredibly effective technique when it comes to filmmaking. But, okay, so we are dealing with Emma in one place, Bent is sitting in the in the bathroom waiting... Maria is is at the you know yeah she's got the she's got the music and everything. Then you have Martin at the soccer stadium, and Jens walking away, and it's like, Bonadale, what are you doing? This is just too much going on at once. It's not it's not more in, intense or or exciting. Like it's pretty obvious that something bad's gonna happen to Jens as soon as he walks away from the stadium. You know that's not surprising anyone and the fact that you've already established that bent is near maria this is when you should bring in ben bent this is when you should establish oh he's near the 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 place now the the forensic lab and let's see yeah <clears throat> gotva slits jens's throat and Maria is chained up and bent is close by and I really love that Maria tries so many different like she keeps trying every time she sees that something isn't working she tries a new tactic I love that I love this little thing of like because 
it's so frustrating when characters like that are stupid, and it's especially annoying when they, they put a, a woman in a situation like that and then act like, oh, women are irrational, they, they can't think creatively. No, women are extremely creative. And, and here we see, yeah, she keeps thinking, you know, it's very, you know, you, the first thing she tries is to basically order him. She's essentially trying to shame him. You know, she's saying, how could you do this? You have to stop it right now. Which, for a lot of people, is going to work. And that is also, you know, if you're a young person and someone does something bad to you, you know, if you've never encountered a serial killer before, I'm not speaking from experience, yeah, that's probably where your mind is going to go. You know, this is, this is how she would react if, like, Let's say that a young, a, a, yeah, she if she was like alone in a, a dark place at, at night, and a, and a guy seemed to be like threatening her, she would be like, "What are you doing? Get away from here!" You know, and and for a lot that would actually work. Doesn't work on Bent. So then she, ah, crap. What was the second thing? I think the second, right, right. Yeah. Then she says, you know. The yeah, you know she she says you know oh, your name is Bent ah oh, you know that's a very pretty name, you know what that means I know what that means, my name is Maria and that means the beautiful, and that's when it you know becomes clear, he's convinced that he did grab Emma, he he won't accept that he accidentally grabbed Maria, and. Let's see. Yeah, she makes fun of the way he speaks, and which you know, again, ableist. Um, and I acknowledge, you know, in the this is a scene where she's been kidnapped by someone, so of course she's gonna make fun of him. But it's not that the mentally ill are, you know. Yeah, as already mentioned earlier in the video, the you know, the mentally ill are more likely to be victims, not perpetrators of violence. And yeah, Martin goes to Gunva, and it's just so like, okay, so the movie needs for Katma to discover that Emma stole the the pictures from Velma so she takes out the pictures right before there's a knock at the door and then Katma just kind of busts in I will say it feels in character based on what we've seen up to this point Katma would definitely like she doesn't even finish I don't does she even start asking she just kind of walks in and then she's like can I walk in? can I come in you know that that makes sense for her. but the fact that the pictures just and this is the kind of thing where, again, like, if you, if earlier she, like, put, grabbed out the, you know, put out the pictures and, like, looked at them and, like, you know, maybe put them away again. And then you have another scene where she brings them out, looks, and, and, you know, yeah, and maybe the second time she doesn't put them away. She just leaves them. There's something she can't quite put her finger on, so she just leaves it to look at later. And so when Kama comes... You know, maybe she wasn't even looking at them. She was just thinking, if no one comes in here anymore, kind of thing, you know. But the fact that she picks, she takes it out right before, just, yeah. And, and yeah, then we get the thing about, no, no, he didn't, Varma never had a son. He had a daughter. And she lived with him, and she was abused, and, yeah. And... Let's see. Yeah, and uh, yeah, at, at this point, I really I felt like Katma must be the the killer. They did a, a good job making it seem like that was her. And then we get the thing about you know, parent, supposedly women are more vengeful. I'm not entirely sure if that's true, but let's see. You know, maybe. I, I don't know for sure. And, yeah, Maria, you know, is like, oh, you know, maybe 
maybe I could touch your cheek and, and Ben comes close and and again you know it obviously it's not that she actually wants to like hold him and comfort him but she realizes you know this is something that might actually work you know he he needs the, the yeah physical affection and I, I will say that was that was something that did kind of kind of work in, in my opinion that this thing of you know, there's a, there's just a, there's, I think it struck a good balance. It's, it's this kind of, it's, it's twisted, the, the, you know, this thing of, like, even just the image, you know, this, this is great, there's this, like, close-up that it cuts to a couple of times of her face as she's straining to strangle him with the chain, and, you know, you have the singing, and you have this thing of, like, she's not usually very feminine, so this is, you know, I mean, essentially, you could, you could say the fact that he sees her, he, he looks at her, and he sees this, you know, f feminine young woman that he, he maybe perceives her as, and he thinks, oh, you know, I'm, I'm safe with her, you know, she will give me some, some physical affection, and then she, she strangles him, and, you know, she's, she's singing this you know, reassuring song, and it's, I don't know, it just, I felt like that really struck the right balance. I think if more of the movie had struck that balance, it's, which is delicate, I'm not saying it's easy, I think the movie would have been, you know, yeah, better. You know, it's it's this thing, of, like, it, in a way it's kind of badass, it's also kind of creepy, it's just, yeah, it it's, yeah. Um, I, I will say, I'm not sure she had a plan for after, but then I guess she didn't know for sure. Like, we, the audience, it's like, it really feels like, okay, Bent is not the one who actually physically attacks anyone other than himself. Like, we only ever, you know, we see him kidnap her. That's obviously awful. We never actually see him, like, do yeah do anything more like a, he he doesn't seem to to stab or slice or anything anyone and yeah you know if maria thought that he would you know you could understand why she gets rid of him as quickly as she can and yeah um then yeah, the the um, after she kills him, then we have the thing of you know the bent said you know I'm doing this <clears throat> for the I guess commissioner is maybe the English word you know and yeah so Maria thinks oh that must mean that it's Kama the commissioner that you know, I've I've heard about, but, you know, Bent is talking about Verma, that commissioner, so that was a good little misdirect, and then Gutva says the very telling line, revenge is freeing. They did a really good job with, with her, like, she, like, I bought it when she was, when she seemed like a, a one of the good, you know, morally good characters, but here at the end, when she takes a turn for the for the sinister, that really worked. It didn't feel like it was a completely different character. And yeah, and she poisons Martin's tea, which is quite clever. You know, of course she's she's gonna offer him tea. It's it's cold out. It's raining have some tea, you know, she's a therapist, she's, she's educated, look, you know, this is my office, what, what do you, you know, do you have nothing to worry about, kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, it can be very effective in horror when you take something where people feel comfortable and you twist it. And, yeah, then we have the, the thing with Vatma putting his hands, let's see, yeah, hands on Martin's face, and we again, it's this you know kind of ableist. I get it. It it's you know it's something 
one has to to get used to you know but it's really gross to to use it as some you know ooh aren't you know blind people super creepy kind of thing you know but yeah and yeah Vatma talks about he has been lonely because of the hair so whenever I'm lonely I just open this box which I think is how a lot of guys act when they are lonely. See, that's a joke. That works so much better in, in Danish because in Danish, the word for box literally is slang for a vagina, which I get. Is it in English? Anyway, black box can be slang for African American vagina. Anyway, but the <clears throat> losing my voice. I'm almost done. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, so, in the first movie, the mistaken identity was, you know, led to this thing of, you know, accidentally, the, the frame job doesn't work quite as well, because Joyce thought Martin was Jens, but then in this one, the mistaken identity is that Maria is kidnapped instead of Emma, and that the the um that maria tells emma that it's Katma who's dangerous which makes her assume that gotva you know is is uh, an ally and and thankfully martin is with with gotva you know kind of thing i also quite like when you know she calls martin's cell phone and it rings in gotva's pocket very nice little it's it's not they didn't come up with it specifically for this movie it's been in other movies but it worked here as well and yeah uh let's see um Gunva slits Katma's throat with the exacto knife i think that it's okay so let's real quick so over the course of the movie, the exacto knife, throat slit, kills Lotte, Jens, and Karma. I think that's a little too many. I appreciate that the body count is higher than the first one. Really, in the first one, you know, at the end of the day, you only actually see there's only one named character who's murdered. Like, you know. We thought that Verma was one of them, which would make two, but no. According to this movie, he survived, so the only named character who dies in the first movie is actually Joyce. You know, and we don't even see... We, we hear it, and we see some blood afterwards, but we don't actually see the gore of it. You know, so I appreciate that here, <clears throat> more named characters are, are killed, and... The you know yeah it's it's pretty effective. There's a couple of times where you see just the little bit of of throat that's been slit, and you see some blood pour out. You know the yeah it was it looked good when the the blood came out. You know like I mentioned it they pushed it too far. It got ridiculous, but the effect itself looked looked quite good. The the practical effects are quite good in the movie, and I think the exacto knife is a it's not quite a knifed glove it's not quite a machete or a kitchen knife but it's a perfectly decent choice as like you know a weapon that that really you know yeah that's that's yeah memorable i th and i appreciate that you know for for sure you know i i Again, not an expert. I, I'm not saying I speak from personal experience, but based on what I know about anatomy, yes, uh, slitting someone's throat like that is probably the most... If, if you're using an exacto knife, you know, if you... Like, obviously, if you've got, like, a sword or something, you may, you know, you're not going to slit a throat, you know, but... Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I think... I mean, there's other places. There's there's other stuff. You know, I I think it would have been pretty cool if one of the attacks went for the eyes, maybe. 
you know, it's not the the most effective like for for kill, but yeah, you know, some, something like that. The the wrist is right there. Um, let's see, maybe a probably don't want to go for like a stomach slash. That's way too Hannibal the movie, not the show. I hear good things about the show. I have very few good things to say about the movie. You know, but just a little more variety, I really think, would have been been great. Um, let's see. Right, and, and yeah, uh, Vatma is about to scalp Martin. And again, we have this thing of, oh, isn't it creepy how he's blind? I do think that the... the you know, impaling him on the on the knife. That was quite good. You know, that was, you know, a memorable kill and creepy and the, the blood pouring out and the fact that he's so, he's still so close to Martin. Again, you know, we, we want the catharsis, but the movie denies us that. It's, you know, yes, he's dead, but he's right there. He's right up in your face. That's quite, uh, yeah. And, yeah, so, I mean, at least none of them are prostitutes, but the this movie does still treat some of the, the characters, you know, yeah, some of the victims are quite disposable. There's nothing wrong with prostitution, sex work is work, but the first movie very much acts like, well, you know, they're just prostitutes, you know, the fact that, like, we, we know almost nothing about, like, we meet Joyce. And and there is some humanizing of her, but most of her screen time she's being humiliated, and especially by Jens and sometimes also Martin, you know. But in this one, like, in in addition to the, let's see, so the the. Yeah, um, you know, when the movie starts, Kalinka is already dead. Over the course of it, Lotte dies. I'm not sure why they felt it necessary to kill off the two major female characters that returned from the first one. You know, the, the first movie had three fairly major female characters. Two of them survived that movie. One of them didn't survive into appearing in this movie at all. And the other dies early in this movie. And it's just... I mean, yeah, by the end of this movie, it seems like, well, you know, the killer wanted Jens, and they thought this was the way to get Jens back. You know, the... the let's see... Like, obviously, in general, the serial killer targeting women in, in fiction is likely to have a misogyny problem. I just don't think it was... I think it could have been helped, and, um, you know, I've, I've not actually been able to find, I, I don't blame, like, um, so yeah, Sophia Coppola did not return for, for this one, um, I'm not 100% sure why, um, Let's see. I mean, she's she is still alive. Um, um, I mean, let's see. In right in 2012, she was, she was diagnosed with cancer, had surgery and chemotherapy, is now in remission. I guess maybe that. Right, right. Yeah, that, that I think that might be why the I do, I don't know enough about cancer which you know for for once that actually is because I've been I don't I don't want to know too much. I cancer's gotten too close. Killed several members of my family. So I try not to think about it, but I can imagine when it's in remission, you might not want to, but, but yeah, hypothetically, they could have recast the, the character, especially considering that, like I said, you know, it brings up suicide all the time, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. Like, essentially, you could have had her 
be like living in exile or something. You could have had a very similar effect, but to just kill off the character. Yeah. Um, and then we have... Um, yeah, um, in, in this movie, it's Emma, not Kalinka, yelling for help so that Martin hears it and comes to to help. And I really appreciate that it's not just, oh, a guy saving the day. She does, she is part of, you know, she's the one who, who shoots. And, right, I, I appreciate that every character who dies in this is someone that we know at least a little bit about the there's no one you know I'm, I'm not saying that that wasn't also the the case and you know in the first one we're told that others have been killed but over the course of the the movie itself Joyce is the the only person we see die but you know this one yeah so let's see over the course of this movie the the characters that die I'm going to try to go in order of the the kill scenes. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Lotte, Jens, Bent, Kramer, and Gunva, and uh, Verma. So, you have six. Holy crap, that's, yeah. So, the first one has one, this one has six, you know, significantly more. And yeah, all of them we knew at least some about. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say... Did I mention God? Yeah, yeah, I think I got all of them, you know. I wouldn't say that I necessarily... I, I don't think the movie ever really made us feel sympathetic with Bent. But we at least, you know, he wasn't just some random face in the crowd. You know, which, again, wasn't a problem with the first movie, but a lot of horror movies do have that. I do really appreciate, I think they get a lot out of, this was something I, I alluded to in the review, the noise that the the exacto blade makes when you, you know, you press the button and you push it up and the blade extends. It has, you know, the, they they make the the noise a tad more... Like, I've, I've certainly never heard one make quite that much noise in real life. And I have, you know, the, we've done some, some like, what do y'all call that in English? Uh, our arts and crafts, I guess, kind of stuff, you know. So, yeah, I've, I've used an X-Acto blade. It does make a distinct noise that they push it to, like, 11, you know, yeah, a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10 in this film. And I think that was absolutely perfect. That was, yeah. And I quite liked when um, Emma and Gunva turn the corner at the exact right, at the exact same time, which is of course necessary in order for her, for for yeah, Gunva to not realize that Emma is, you know, right on the other, yeah. And I really admit, like, the moment that, you know, they're passing the body of Kama and Emma picks up the gun, that was also like, thank you, thank you for not being so, you know, unbearably naive that you would leave a gun behind when you just, yeah. Um, yeah, and let's see. Yeah, and, and Gutva is, like, running and shouting they the the performance gets very intense where here where it's very subdued earlier. I think that really worked. Now, um, let's see. Yeah, I think I already somewhat addressed. You know, I think this movie may hurt the perception of mental health care and mental health patients. Honestly, I wouldn't rule out that this movie might do for for that what the first one did for the um, let's see, you know the yeah with the first the first one had a bunch of Danes opt out of being organ donors because of the the necrophilia aspect of the first movie. 
I worry that this movie might make Danes more reluctant to accept mental health care for themselves or for loved ones or, you know, to trust mental health professionals and that kind of thing. And I, I think it could have been avoided. I really think, like, <clears throat> the I, I haven't watched um, Don't Worry Darling, but I hear that it criticizes Jordan Peterson, and I really think that's the way to go, because there are dangerous people today, but they don't, they're not the mental health cases that make us uncomfortable, they're these kind of, yeah, you know, Jordan Peterson, Andrew Tate, people who verbally convince at least some people that they're absolutely right and yeah that those are much more likely to cause harm than <clears throat> the yeah people who have mental health issues who are already getting a lot of hostility from people and yeah um Emma fires the gun, and we get a great release of all the tension that's been built up. The fact that we don't see it hit, like, did the effects budget run out? I, I didn't really, maybe I'm missing something, maybe there's a good reason for it, it just doesn't, I didn't really see super good reason for it, yeah, and, and we end with the, the four young people on a beach, and Martin is also there. And we have this line where, you know, I think it's Maria who says, why would you talk about her sex life? Emma's father is sitting right there. And, like, because of the editing, it's like, N no, what are you talking about? He was, he's all the way over, he's he's way over there now. I don't think he even heard any of what was being said. Like, just, yeah. Anyway, um, I do kind of like that Maria is wearing a t-shirt that says, I fucked your dad. You know, it's the kind of thing where you'd expect it to be a guy wearing a shirt saying, I fucked your mom. So, so that's a good, you know, yeah. And, apparently, yeah, so, so Maria and Sofus had sex. And, you know, Sofus is like, ah, you know, we finally had sex kind of thing. And, you know, like... Do they high five or shake hands? Some something like that. But you know, like is like congratulating him on that. Just yeah, pretty. Um, yeah, and we get some some jokes about how pale Sophus is, and they end up all going swimming. And I'm just sitting. You know, I'll I'll tell you what's swimming. There's something swimming around in my mind, and it's the words. Why are we getting a happy ending? Like, this one isn't even, like, I, I didn't really, I didn't love that the first one ended with a happy ending either. I don't think it works well for this, for quite this kind of thing. But at least in the first movie, the happy ending, there was a thematic element to it because it's the last game of, it's, yeah, it's the last game of Dare. And it's this thing of, like, why are you even still playing the game of dare? The the point was, you know, one of you has to get married when the game ends. You know, if one of you fails at the game, you have to get married. You're getting married. Why are you still playing the game? And that really goes to this kind of male fragility, you know, which I can speak to too personally. You know, I myself have have some insecurities. And I've, you know, I've spent my life surrounded by guys who were extremely insecure. You know, I, I'd like to think that I have at least a little bit better handle on, but sadly, no, I, I definitely also have had, I'm, I'm better now, but when I was a, a teenager, I was, I was very insecure. And yeah, it's this thing, like, if you, if you want a guy to do something that he doesn't want to do, just dare him to do it or tell you know in in some way threaten the the masculinity of the guy that you're trying you know sadly a lot of the time it's going to work you know so that that was you know yeah that that worked really well there 
But here, it's like, you didn't really resolve, like, okay, I get how, you know, okay, for sure, Verma is definitely dead. I'm almost certain Gunva is dead. You know, it it's, yeah, the, the, the immediate physical, and, and, and Bet is, so the immediate physical threat is, is gone, you know, but it, it's not, like, thematically, there's no connection between this last scene and anything else in the movie. Like, you, you have some, you know, you have this thing of these, these young people being, you know, making, making jokes at each other expense kind of thing, which, yeah, you know, we've seen them do that, you know, earlier in the movie as well, but it, otherwise, again, it's this thing of, you know, not making one movie, but putting the concepts for several movies into just the, the one, yeah. Um, that is pretty much right. So, yeah, um, yeah, other than, uh, let's see, we also, yeah, like some other soft reboots, the villain here is inspired by the villain of the original, you know, like, obviously, Gunva is actually related, but Bent is inspired by Velma. And, uh, Bent gave me some vibes of, like, John Doe from Seven, and, yeah, you know, almost 30, 30 years later, we're still taking inspiration from Seven, which, yeah, fair enough, it's, it's excellent, and... Let's see, I appreciate that, you know, Verma is, you know, basically underplayed, like, he never just, like, goes full ham, so Bet is a good contrast to that, I quite appreciate that decision, and, yeah, that is it for this video so let me know you know what is your favorite soft reboot and right up uh, real quick I I'm not super familiar with horror soft reboots you know I, I mentioned I watched the Halloween you know um, H40 trilogy, the, the three new movies that, you know, Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends. I have read that there is also a, a soft reboot for The Exorcist. I will admit, I have not watched, I've, the only Exorcist movie I've watched was the very first one. Um, so, you know, and, and that was a while ago. Uh, I have not watched that in maybe 10, 15 years. I don't know. I mean, there's just... There are a lot of other things I watch when I want to laugh at something. You know, which is not to say that that movie does not make me laugh. It cracks me up. It has me rolling on the floor. But, you know... Now I know why. I, I only have a VHS copy. I don't watch VHS so much no more. So that's that's why, you know. Uh, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. Once for more links to stuff like relevant playlists, I suggest a video for you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. I also do one talking about a horror show, which is, you know, I, I just finished um, Blood Curse, and next I am going to be doing videos on, actually, hold on, I guess I have it. Ash versus Evil Dead, my, yeah, my Christmas present, which I'm very grateful for to my father. So, uh, yes, there's going to be a weekly video of that, um, 
as soon as, so let's see, yeah, tomorrow, or I guess by the time you watch this, maybe today, um, the 22nd, there, the, we're going to start getting the, um, I can't believe I'm blinking a little, uh, uh, season two of What If. And there's a, apparently the last of those is going to air on like the 30th of December. So the 30, so, so yeah, obviously I'm going to do videos on each of those episodes. The 31st, I expect to get back into doing a, going to try to make it daily, Not gonna, probably not going to be every single day daily, Marvel TV show. Um, you know, I've reached the start of season four of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm doing Marvel TV in the, in the order it originally aired other than Netflix Marvel, which I already, or Marvel, Netflix, whatever. And there's one that I, I wanted to do it, but it's no longer on Disney+. Plus. I think it's Runaways. But but yeah, the rest of them I am doing, and I think that might be about it. So yeah, uh, recently there have been thoughts of it, I think I'm not very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more of it like this, you're luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And... Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try very hard not to suspect the next person who offers me a comforting cup of tea.